Hi, I'm Dominique Blocker with City TV. Welcome to Inside Santa Barbara, the city's only news magazine show. We bring you up to date on the city's most significant issues, projects, and events. The need for a new police building has been discussed on and off for decades now. But due to recent information presented to City Council, the issue is once again at the epicenter of discussion. Chris Bell has the story. Walk up to the police department. To understand a man, walk a mile in his shoes, the saying goes. And recently, members of the City Planning Commission and Fire and Police Commission attempted to do just that at police headquarters. All right, but this group here, just follow me. The building serves as the command and control center for the entire department, a department that has more than doubled in size since the structure was built in 1959. We run the day-to-day -day operations of the Santa Barbara Police Department out of this facility. Uh, all our calls for service are dispatched from our 911 dispatch center. Our officers uh, conduct briefings here, conduct their investigations here. Basically, we provide police services to the entire city out of this building and the uh, one behind us. At first glance, the lobby, the only part of the building the general public ever sees, seems modern and functional. But this area is the only area of the building to have ever been significantly remodeled. The lobby here was remodeled about five, six years ago, so it's, it's very modern. You'll see the rest of the building, you know, is kind of the uh, early 1960s, but this was, this was redone about five years ago. Discussions about remodeling the police headquarters have been taking place for decades. In 1999, a bond measure to fund an expansion was put on the ballot, but failed to pass. After that, the police department began leasing space in a nearby office building and started pursuing an incremental approach to remodeling. The first target area was the locker room. And, you know, we got in there and the electrical systems that were in there are 1950 vintage and couldn't find any replacement parts. So, you know, a modern locker room is going to have... Uh, you know, places to charge uh, their, their radios and, and cell phones and things like that that, they, that the, a modern police, uh, a police officer needs. And, and so the current electrical panel wouldn't even support that little addition. So what started as a simple locker room remodel began to morph into something drastically different. It was like that thread. You just kept pulling it and it just kept unraveling. The ventilation system was, was shot. And so we started getting into um, some of the crawl spaces in the building, which were just full of asbestos and lead. And, okay, so we need to abate those asbestos and lead. And in order to abate the, that, you need to move people out of the building. As more and more deficiencies were discovered, staff determined a complete building assessment was necessary. And that's when the fatal flaw that would doom any remodel was discovered. We did the seismic on the building and found that there were some very significant elements of the building that were of concern. Uh, we pursued a, uh, a conceptual design and cost estimate for that, and it was astronomical to try and structurally upgrade this building. And in the end, we could come really close to meeting essential services, which is what the building code requires, but we could not actually meet the building code. After learning of the seismic deficiency of the building and watching the projected cost of remodeling skyrocket, City Council unanimously determined that a new police building was needed. Now the question was, relocation or reconstruction? When we realized that we were looking at a new facility, we looked at a number of locational alternatives throughout town. We started primarily with city-owned land and looked at a number of city facilities. They didn't work out for a number of reasons. One, they were either located in a floodway, and you don't want to be in a flood area with your police building. They were located maybe on the other side of the freeway down on the waterfront, and so a disconnect from downtown if the freeway were to have some uh, collapse issues. And then what kind of trumped all of it is that the police department really likes where they're at now. The location is central in downtown, but it's also the proximity to the courts and the district attorney's office where they do so much work. We also looked at opportunities of purchasing property or doing some public-private partnerships with uh, private property owners. And the problem with that is that it adds an additional cost. If we've got city land, you at least are starting kind of with free land from that standpoint. And so looking at some of those private purchasing opportunities didn't make sense. We looked at purchasing existing office buildings and retrofitting them, but police buildings are so unique. They have to meet the highest seismic standards. They've got a shooting range. They've got record storage. They have evidence storage. They have locker rooms. 
that the amount of money you'd have to put into retrofitting an existing office building also just didn't make any practical sense. Having exhausted all alternatives, Council then directed staff to go forward with some preliminary design work on complete reconstruction. So we've recently hired an architect. They're going to do a space planning needs assessment. They're going to do a preliminary conceptual design and most importantly come up with a cost estimate so we have a real good idea about what a new building might cost. Leach Mounts Architects, a firm that has designed over 70 public safety facilities and done over 100 needs assessments of this type, was hired for the job. Howard Leach is very familiar with the Santa Barbara Police Building. He previously performed two assessments on the structure, one in the 1980s, the other in the 1990s. And it was inadequate then, and so it's only gotten worse since then. And while his assessment isn't complete, his professional opinion about the building remains the same. It's dangerous, not secure, and a terrible to work, a place to work, very terrible place to work. That opinion is one echoed by all who took the tour. Uh, it was shocking, frankly, particularly that locker room space. Um, it's, it's amazing that people make use of that space at this point. The space is cramped. It seems damp. It seems like there's, it's very claustrophobic. Uh, being in there and there are uh, a lot of people crammed into a very small space. When you leave the building you realize that we're not giving our police department all the tools that they need to do their job in serving the public and making this a safe community. Uh, the undersized, the cramped conditions, the inefficiencies, the adjacencies of some very sensitive issues where you have witnesses next to criminals and the, and the cross-pollination of information that could happen in there, having the detectives room where they're strategizing investigations real close to where we're processing uh, suspects and cases is just so dysfunctional and wrong uh, that we got to do better because it really leads to increased public safety and the ability for the officers to serve the public in an efficient and effective manner. And while efficiency is a big issue, there are even larger issues trying to run a 21st century operation from a mid-20th century facility. As far as court cases go, it's very important to have good audio and video uh, when it comes to interviewing uh, suspects uh, for court purposes because um, you know, that, that's you know, the best evidence you can have. As it is right now, the audio and video system um, usually doesn't work half the time and uh, you know, the, the, the building is just not designed uh, to have all the audio-visual technology that we have nowadays. It, the, the building wasn't designed for that 50 years ago. Police officers say they are able to do their jobs, but the antiquated deficient structure they call headquarters is preventing them from providing even better service to the public. Imagine this, for example. You're a patient and you're having a, an important operation done and you have one of the world's greatest surgeons operating on you, but he's going to operate on you out of a 50-year-old obsolete operating room. You probably wouldn't feel very good about that operation. Same is true here. And with all that asbestos and lead in the building, as well as its seismic deficiency, the situation would be even worse in the case of a disaster like an earthquake. Yeah, I think, I think they're, they're going to find out real quick how difficult it is to um, be able to um, uh, serve the community in a time of crisis when, when the building is, is inoperable. And we all saw during uh, the uh, Hurricane Katrina just the chaos that ensued when uh, a community lost its police force. It really did, and so I think it, it really emphasizes why it's so important that we have a, a building that we know our, our police officers know they can rely on and know they can support this community in a, in a disaster. It's not just about where the officers are going to be, it's about where people can go in the event of an emergency. And I'll tell you, if a portion or all of this building pancakes, where are people going to go? What they're going to be looking for is the fire station, the hospital, and the police station. And if you take out one of those facilities, we're going to be in a world of hurt. And because the 911 dispatch center is housed in the basement of the police building, that world of hurt would extend beyond the police department in the event of a disaster. Our 911 center handles all the emergency traffic for uh, police response, fire, and ambulances. So our 911 center is, is the nerve center of the Santa Barbara Police Department. It's the critical link between the public and the first responders. I think the most remarkable thing was going down into the basement 
where the 9-11 response r room is and feeling like it's a worst case situation ready to happen. Faced with that scenario, City Council has directed staff to investigate relocating the 911 dispatch center at least temporarily while the building project continues. We're, we're drawing up plans to move them as we speak uh, to a more modern structure in the Granada garage. Uh, that garage has unknown to many people. It actually has quite a lot of office space over in that facility. Uh, it's uh, built to contemporary standards and we can put the dispatch center in a safe, secure location, especially during the reconstruction phase. The city has set aside $20 million for the police headquarters project, but more will be necessary, which leads to the next question, how to pay for it. The way most jurisdictions build new major facilities like this is going to the voters with some sort of voter approved revenue measure. And so council is saying we need to think about that. This project is such a priority that we need to consider some revenue measure uh, to fund the remaining balance of this project. So we're working on a, on a path that council can consider placing a measure on the November 2012 ballot. We don't know what that measure might be. We don't know how much it might cost, but it's something we're working towards to gather that information, and that's just going to be a dialogue the council is going to have to have with the community and decide whether we want to go to the voters and ask for their support for this. As council considers funding options for a police headquarters of the future, the dedicated officers and staff of the department will continue to provide essential services to the community from a building of the past. Stay tuned for more information and discussion about this project as it moves forward. The Haley Street Bridge is one of six bridges being replaced along Mission Creek. The enhanced habitat and original artwork surrounding the bridge are added benefits for our community. And Inside Santa Barbara takes you there. The bridge at the intersection of Haley and De Lavina streets has been serving the West Downtown neighborhood since the horse and buggy ruled the road. A hundred years later, the bridge has been refurbished and widened. The Haley De Lavina bridge project actually started back in uh, 2002, 2003, uh, when Caltrans finished up a report that showed that the bridge was uh, structurally deficient. And so we got work on design on that, and we were fortunate to be able to have federal matching funds from the highway bridge uh, replacement and reconstruction program which uh, will pay for 88 and a half percent of the project so that the matching funds 11 and a half would come from city funds kind of leveraging our funds to get the bridge replaced and Haley was the first bridge of up to nine coming here in the future replacing these bridges they're all kind of reaching the end of their life and at various various states of, of disrepair The project fits into an even larger Mission Creek flood control project. As part of that larger project, other improvements will be made throughout the creek, such as the reestablishment of native plants. Uh, with all the bridge projects that we're doing in, in the, uh, along Mission Creek, there's always a restoration portion. And with this project uh, and future projects, there'll be restoration areas to try and reestablish native plants and uh, habitat for a creek aquatic life and, and that's always been the mission of the, these bridge projects is to try to bring back that, that life that did exist before all the houses were built right up on, on the banks of the creek. In order to enhance the neighborhood charm and add to the uniqueness of the bridge, local art groups were included in the development. Some of the uh, I think more interesting elements that could be done is we did work with the arts community and there's a, a lot of tile work that was done by local children that kind of accent the bridge. I think there's an arts and crafts look to the bridge that we were able to come together with HLC and, and come up with a very unique design uh, that kind of speaks to this historic neighborhood. Another important phase of the bridge project is the preservation and remodel of a corner house that's part of the area's historical heritage. Part of the neighborhood required that we did purchase and remove one house and uh, but we were able to save there was uh, quite a few others that you know were on the on the verge and one of them was a historical structure which we were able to purchase and we're currently restoring and hope to have that done in September and uh, the city will probably turn around and just sell that house uh, on the open market.
I think one of the most significant things after the bridge was done was the response from the community. I think the, the investment in this part of the neighborhood that probably it's been a while since the city's done any significant improvements here has really um, brought a lot of pride to the neighborhood. There's, you know, as I mentioned, there's the art elements that were done, the tile work, and there was actually even a stamp concrete that goes through the it shows the designates the edges of the bridge that kind of just make it unique and different and a lot of the responses I'm getting is just the pride the general pride someone's made an investment in this neighborhood and it is uh, the first of upcoming events we have another one planned to, to updo the uh, improve the lighting for the whole neighbor this whole lower west downtown area and so I think that continued investment will really bring people to have some take real pride in their neighborhood. Currently, the Ortega Street Bridge over Mission is under construction. To follow the progress of construction, go to santabarbaraca.gov forward slash Ortega Bridge. We'll be right back with more Inside Santa Barbara. When you learn CPR, it's for life. It's important because you never know when you might need it. Be the difference. Learn CPR. Ocean water quality have long been a challenge in urban areas, but the Upper Las Casitas Creek Restoration Project found creative ways to improve the Arroyo Burrow Creek watershed. Inside Santa Barbara takes you through the project from beginning to end. Hundreds of years ago, Santa Barbara's geography looked relatively similar to today. There was the same mountain range with creeks bringing water from the top to the ocean just a few miles below. Although our mountains and ocean are still in their original locations, Santa Barbara's creeks have drastically changed. Over time, they were filled with concrete and asphalt and narrowed to allow for the development of the city and flood control. Why is that a problem? Because soil and plants act as natural filtration systems. Not only do residents and visitors recreate in creek areas, they also go in the ocean. And if you want a clean ocean, you can't begin at the beach because the health of our ocean begins at home. The number one water pollution source at the beaches in Santa Barbara is urban runoff. And it starts up here at the top of the watershed in the urban areas. And when we have rain events or we have people uh, washing their cars in their driveway or overspray from irrigation, that water runs over the surface of the urban area through the streets. It picks up oil, uh, grease, uh, it picks up metals, and bacteria, and those w find their way down to the ocean through the storm drain system and the creeks, and that water is untreated. Everyone in the city is partly responsible for that pollution source. Everyone in the city is part of the solution for that. So we want to stop the, the pollution in the first place, but to the extent we still have uh, water running off the roads and so forth, bringing pollution into the storm drains and into the creeks, we want to be able to, to treat that and, and make sure that the water is clean by the time it reaches the beach. That's where the Upper Las Casitas Creek Restoration and Storm Water Management Project comes in. The purpose of the 13-month-long project is to not only create healthier habitat upstream, but also to improve the water quality downstream. By detaining and treating stormwater and incidental runoff at the Santa Barbara Golf Club, water quality downstream in Las Positas Creek, the Arroyo Burrow Estuary, and Arroyo Burrow Beach is improved. The municipal golf course is actually the headwaters for Las Positas Creek, which is one of the largest tributaries to Arroyo Burrow. And what we've done is to do a creek restoration project here and also the stormwater pollution uh, treatment. And what that, uh, what that allows us to do is work our way down the watershed and continue with creek restoration efforts through that wa throughout that watershed, which will not only have important wildlife habitat benefits, but will improve water quality downstream. To fully understand the role the upstream area plays in water quality at the ocean, you can start at the source. 
rainstorms. Water that comes from rain events, known as stormwater, that does not soak into the ground becomes surface runoff, which in Santa Barbara flows through the storm drain system until it reaches the creeks and then the ocean. As it does this, the storm water gathers and transports pollutants such as oil and grease, chemicals, nutrients, metals, and bacteria. And since storm water is not treated, everything picked up along its path will be deposited directly through our creeks and into the Pacific Ocean. The best way to prevent this process is to slow that runoff down. Part of the, the problems that we're um, experienced here at the site was really rapid storm runoff from the Samarkand neighborhood, um, from Adams School, from on the golf course and the parking lot here. And when that storm water is moving really quickly, it picks up a lot of sediment, which is a, a water pollutant, and attached to a lot of that sediment is oftentimes bacteria, which can be bad. Um, but we also had a lot of erosion along the eastern portion of the course, right below the Adams School, and so a lot of the grading that we did, uh, earth moving and so forth, was really directed towards both slowing down a lot of that water and creating these pools and basins where water would collect and either infiltrate into the ground, so just slowly seep into the ground, or it was designed to not have these really steep erosive banks, and so basically laying those banks back and, and planting them with native plants to create habitat. The city used a combination of berms and basins along with creating bioswells and grading the creek for erosion prevention to create a creek habitat more conducive to slowing the water. Detention is important because storm water is treated primarily by the settling of suspended particles and the associated pollutants, including microorganisms. Settling of the particles can only occur when the water moves slow enough. Research conducted at UCSB has found that up to 90% of the suspended load and associated pollutants can be removed during detention. So this is a, a berm which creates the basin and this is actually called a retention basin because it retains water for longer periods of time. Um, in other parts of the project we've constructed detention basins which are just a temporary storage on the order of a couple hours to a day at max. Um, but this will hold water through the summer. And so this way we can create a lot more habitat for migratory birds, as well as habitat for native wild plants. In addition to the retention basins, the project added features that help treat runoff from smaller storms as well. Two types of bioswells were created to slow down the flow of water so that the solids from the runoff have time to settle and filter. In the areas that see higher flows, the bioswells include rock aeration, gravel filtration, and emergent plants, providing increased opportunity for removal of materials. These bioswells remove up to 80% of suspended pollutants, adding to the increased quality of water that ends up downstream and then eventually in the ocean. If we can stop the water long enough to let that sediment settle out, that will help clean the water. Uh, microbes in the soil will break down most of those contaminants. Plants planted around these basins will uptake a lot of the nutrients that can cause algae blooms and other problems downstream. But it's not only water quality that is improved by this project. Flood control and wildlife habitat were also significantly enhanced. Right now um, in the world of stormwater management it's really exciting because we've got solutions that can address multiple problems such as flooding and water quality issues. Before, a lot of the stormwater management issues were more directed at reducing flood waters. And so those, although they were really effective at getting rid of flood water, a lot of other problems have cropped up such as water quality. Um, it seems like the more concrete flood control channels that were put in the worse water quality got over time. And so now we're at a point where we're trying to find solutions to not create another problem in our creeks, but also to be able to solve multiple issues at the same time. And this is kind of a good example where we're reducing floodwaters downstream, but also creating great wildlife habitat and increasing water quality, making it better on site here. This project was designed to, be a, to serve multiple objectives. And 
Uh, two of the important objectives, of course, of water quality and creek restoration. Those are the primary objectives for uh, Measure B and for the city's creeks division. This project also presented an opportunity to provide some flood protection for uh, residents downstream of the golf course who, when we have large storm events in Santa Barbara, in the past have been flooded out of their homes and businesses. And uh, through this project, we're able to control those peak flows of floodwaters so that uh, we, can, we can reduce the peak or shave the tops of those peaks off and hopefully prevent flooding downstream. And uh, through this project, we're, la we're able to hold approximately 4 million gallons of stormwater, and, and uh, we can release that at a different time when the, after the heavy part of the rain is over. The benefits of the project don't end with water quality and habitat restoration. Students at Adams Elementary School, located adjacent to the municipal golf course at Las Positas Road, received new habitat along with a big learning experience. What kind of plant? Before the Upper Las Positas Creek Restoration Project, the area that ran between Adams Elementary and the Santa Barbara Golf Course was filled with asphalt and concrete. The asphalt ditch allowed for water to flow quickly off the school's campus. However, that also led to erosion downstream as the water flowed through the golf course property. This, compounded with the loss of habitat and water quality, made the section of creek at Adams Elementary School an ideal spot to make changes. With the asphalt, it's, there's no biology happening. There's no native plants there that are taking up nutrients and taking it out of the water. There's no wildlife habitat there, and so we lost a lot of those functions. And so getting that asphalt ditch and replacing it with native plants and allowing soil to be there really helps water quality and habitat. Working with school staff, the city created a more natural environment that reduces damaging erosion and improves creek water on the golf course. The city also created a more natural wetland that will be the focus of educational outreach efforts for years to come. This is their favorite time of the day. They love to have that hands-on experience. It's just it's important to see, I think, how science is related to real life experiences. Now, water that enters the bioswell from the storm drain on Las Positas Road will slowly pass through the newly restored creek channel as it heads downstream and enters elements of the larger stormwater management system on the city's golf course. This has resulted in significant expansion and enhancement of wetlands benefiting wildlife, water quality, and the community. We wanted to to make it an outdoor learning classroom. And the bigger vision was combining the garden with the bioswell so the students could actually have that hands-on science and learning happening on a weekly and, and, and daily basis. Water that we're talking about is rainwater. The students were involved from the early stages of the project, participating in before and after visits. The school and creek staff used the bioswell as an opportunity for local youth to learn about restoration and the importance of healthy creeks. There's a lot of opportunity at the beginning of this project to really branch out not only to the golfers but also the neighbors. And with the Adams School there's a great opportunity to really engage the kids in real hands-on activities. And so we designed a small habitat garden at the school had the kids help us plant it, as well as right now we're working on a permanent signage program, and so we'll get their input and really try to tie it into their science curriculum so that it's an overall win for the school and, and win for the city. Well, we really wanted them to have ownership and feel like it's their bioswell and their garden, and that's why it was important for our students actually to be a part of the process. When the time came to plant the area, students joined Creeks Division staff for several work days where they installed hundreds of native wetland plants. This hands-on experience has only continued as the bioswell and recently added school garden have become part of the school's curriculum. We're able to meet state standards and national standards in a hands-on way with the bioswell. The city has been extremely, extremely helpful in creating that science curriculum and the city actually um, purchased hoses and um, gardening supplies and 
um, pretty much gave us a budget to be able to have some science equipment for every student that does work in the bioswell in the garden. In our after school program, they also use um, the bioswells as far as working with hands on experiments as well. So it's not just for the classroom, but it's for the after school program as well. So everybody benefits. All of the project changes focus on improving the water quality of Las Positas Creek. Yet city staff had another element to consider. The fact that nearly all of the project is right next to the city's municipal golf course. Because of this, the final product had to maintain the playability and aesthetic standards at the Santa Barbara Golf Club. Playability was, was one of our uh, primary considerations in designing this project. So now what we have on the course are some new water features. The response from the, the golfing community has been fabulous. They're very impressed with the uh, aesthetic beauty of the course and they're challenged by the, by the new water hazards on the course. By putting in natural landscaping elements and native habitats surrounding the water basins, the Creeks Division was able to enhance the golf club's atmosphere. Beyond these enhancements, the Creeks project was the perfect opportunity to make other needed changes at the golf club by combining the Upper Las Positas Creek restoration project with the golf club's safety improvement plan. Part of the construction project was we wanted to add more cart path to the golf course because golfers were unable to play the course after significant rain events and we used a lot of the soil from the project to um, add mounding to protect golfers around the new greens. So do you think the two work? Well, I think they work great. Otherwise, it would have been under construction for maybe a year and a half, two years, and we condensed it to a little over a year. Besides the benefits to the course that would eventually be seen, Creeks and Golf Club staff also reached out to the golf community through committee meetings and interaction with players. Yeah, we did a lot of outreach, community outreach. We had. Um, a lot of public service announcements about it. Um, it was in the paper, and then we also did a open forum up at the golf course, where up at the golf shop, sorry, where we had uh, one day a week where um, the Creeks Department would be on hand at a table to answer questions and uh, give feedback on to the public about how the project was going. So that was a big help. We also that outreach, along with education on the benefits to both the course and community contributed to the player's eventual acceptance of the project. Because in the end, the city got cleaner water, animals now have more native habitat, and golfers have a more challenging and scenic course to play on. As a professional and as a golfer, I think it adds to the uh, overall aesthetic quality of the golf course. Not only that does it you know, clean the water that runs into a borough estuary, it also you know, makes it more challenging for the golfer, and as the golf course superintendent, I'm more you know, proud to be out here and call this my home club. The Upper Las Positas Creek Restoration Project serves as an example of the ways creative problem solving can lead to a multitude of benefits. By setting out to improve water quality downstream in Las Positas Creek and thus in our ocean, the city was able to enhance flood protection, native habitat for wildlife, and children's education not to mention making the Santa Barbara Golf Club a more attractive and challenging course to play. In the end, these changes will help the city of Santa Barbara come out ahead financially as well. This is a, a, a natural way to treat the water. Uh, that's what happens in a, in a natural system and in, in the environment and uh, it doesn't require any kind of energy use or any kind of uh, fil filters that need to be purchased and, and replaced and maintained. And so uh, our long-term maintenance costs will also be decreased by using this type of system. This past winter with its higher than average rainfall was the perfect opportunity to test the new system. I think this was the second wettest December on record and the project performed perfectly. Um, it was really great to see the, all the basins are full and we've got about 3.6 million gallons of stormwater held on site. So it's a really a phenomenal success. For more information on the Upper Las Positas Creek Restoration Project, you can visit santabarbaraca.gov forward slash creeks. Over the years, we've shown you many ways to conserve water. But did you know that saving water is more than just turning off the faucet? 
Jordan Katz showcases some of the latest water-saving products. Flowing from your kitchen faucet, flushing down the toilet, spraying over your front lawn. A single day of water use in the home is no small feat. In fact, a single residence can go through hundreds of gallons per day. As it becomes clear that potable water is one of the most limited natural resources on the planet, more value is placed on every drop. That is literally the case for people that take steps to conserve water in their homes. The City of Santa Barbara and several local businesses have joined in efforts to get residents to conserve. Products such as high-efficiency toilets and shower nozzles, rotating sprinklers, and smart controllers are especially effective at conserving water. All of us know that water conservation is one of those things that we're never going to forget. We only have so much water, and we, we live in this beautiful area, but it is a semi-arid environment, and so any of the water that we that we conserve or that we save today, we rely on that when the dry times come. When it comes to conserving water, the first place most of us look is to our own sinks and toilets. Brett Musser helps homeowners retrofit their indoor appliances to make them both water and cost efficient. Well, basically high efficiency toilet is a water saving toilet rated at 1.28 gallons per minute. So it's uh, below the normal 1.6 gallons per minute toilet. Basically there's uh, two types. Um, there's uh, the single flush type and then there's also the dual flush. But while changing your indoor appliances to be more water efficient may be the tipping point to a water conscious lifestyle, the real dent in your pocketbook will come with changes to your landscape irrigation system. Probably 70% of the water we use is in our landscapes, it's outside of the home. One great way to save on irrigation is with rotating sprinkler nozzles. A rotating sprinkler is a sprinkler that's usually retrofit or used in place of a spray nozzle. And it's got multiple streams that rotate at different angles to uh, irrigate lawn usually, but also slope much more evenly than sprays do. With a spray head, it, you know, they say they're 15 feet apart. They don't necessarily put the water out evenly over that 15 feet. So if you need to put down an inch of water in a week, you may actually have to water some places two inches to get the dry spots wet enough. With an MP rotator, that puts out the water so evenly that you really can water much closer to one inch a week to, to make sure everything is watered but not over water. You don't have the wet spots and the dry spots. Everything gets watered evenly. As simple as screwing on a nozzle, switching to rotating sprinklers may be the easiest retrofit project there is in irrigation. It can save you up to 30% of your current water use. And once you get the water saving bug, you'll quickly graduate to the next tier of water efficiency products, starting with smart controllers. Smart controllers basically work by constantly adjusting the valve run times based on the weather and the plant requirements. There's a variety of ways that they get the information by satellites, by on-site weather monitors, um, or off the internet. Um, but they all basically take that information, crunch it in a variety of ways, and come up with lengths of time to run your valves. Irrigation valves, that is. Smart controllers work with natural fluctuations in climate to water plants exactly as much as they need it and not a drop more. The CIMIS station stands for California Irrigation Management Information System and in fact that's what you see behind us. For those of you who golf we also have one of these units out on the 10th hole of the municipal golf course and what it does is it brings all the weather data on a hourly daily basis to help us determine how much we need to irrigate. We're not managing our water as we should. It used to just be, well, I want it green, so I'm gonna water it same as my dad did, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 15 minutes. But Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 15 minutes in March is totally inappropriate. In August, that may be the perfect time. Different types of plants use different amounts of water. Um, grass uses a lot more water than most shrubs. Natives use way less water than grass. So you program that into the controller and then the controller has an idea of how much water these plants need. And if water conservation isn't enough of a reason to go green, 
the city has made retrofitting particularly appealing by offering a host of rebates and other incentives for switching to water efficient products. And right now we actually have a fabulous program. It's called the Smart Landscape Rebates Program. And that's to assist people who are currently irrigating. They've got a landscape, but they want to try and water it more efficiently. So our Smart Landscape Rebate is actually going to help people out by paying 50% of the cost of the materials. So the cost of the rotating nozzles that you purchase, the cost of putting a pressure regulator so that your sprinklers aren't just blasting and blowing mist everywhere, 50% of the cost of installing a smart controller. It also will help to remove the high water using landscape. So if there's a lawn area and the only person that walks on it is the guy you pay to mow it, then maybe it's time to reimagine that yard. Put something that's a ground cover. Put something that's got beautiful flowers for the butterflies and the bees that makes your heart happy when you look outside and uses a third of the amount of water. Curious to see how much you can save? The city offers free water use inspections with no commitment to retrofit. We do free water checkups. Those include landscape checkups where we go through, turn all the irrigation zones on, take a look at your controller. If your landscaper's there, we'll talk with them a little bit. We give reference material on how to find out what the watering index or what the seasonal adjust percentage is. We also do indoor water checkups where we check all the plumbing, make sure there's no leaks in the toilets. And it's totally free for any of the, the City of Santa Barbara water customers. Not only is conserving water good for the planet, but it also saves you money. This community effort makes it easier than ever to retrofit your home for water efficiency. Because when it comes to water, less is more. So you don't have to come in here and change the times and the days all the time. You just have to do that one little thing. That's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> to find out more about these products, go to SaveWaterSC.org. We'll be right back with more Inside Santa Barbara. <laughs> No matter where you surf, your favorite wave begins right here, on your street. That's because storm drains lead straight to our creeks and ocean. When water washes into storm drains, pollutants like detergents, oil, and pet waste go along for the ride. Help keep our creeks and beaches clean. Take your car to a car wash and always pick up after your pet. Remember, the ocean begins on your street. When you learn CPR, it's for life. It's important because you never know when you might need it. Be the difference. Learn CPR. Barbara's new airport terminal has a dazzling new public art collection for travelers to enjoy. This public art program adds to the passengers' traveling experience and reflects the culture and history of our region. Daniel Russell takes us inside. Looking up as you enter the new Santa Barbara Airport Terminal, it's almost impossible to miss the beautiful Spanish design along the ceiling beams. It's called Santa Barbara Sky Gazing. We wanted to do something that was, uh, to us as artists, um, what inspired us emotionally about Santa Barbara. And we settled on its beauty. And its beauty meaning its natural flora, its natural landscape, and its architecture. Set within a wispy golden outline is Santa Barbara's city flower, the hibiscus, along with the matelija poppy. The two regional motifs weave in and out of the Moorish golden railing that glides elegantly upward. Vidya designed and cut each of the intricate stencil boards by hand. The prep work was two months. Two months of drawing, layout, designing, and then hand cutting um, about 50 stencils. The stenciling required Vidya and her team to stand on tall scaffolding to paint each wooden beam separately. Navigating on the scaffold was a little gnarly. <laughs> we were up at about 50 feet, 
Um, but once up there and you get your sea legs, as they say, um, we made ourselves at home and we worked away. Santa Barbara Sky Gazing accents the lobby at the new terminal with an artful nod at Santa Barbara's history, helping to create a serene atmosphere for all passengers to enjoy. Our motivation was to do a beautiful job and to captivate interest, uh, to do the best artwork that we could do according to our own expertise, and to be that kind of an inspiration of beauty. That uh, for me, beauty gives joy. Hanging over passengers' heads in the new airport terminal lobby is a restored lantern from the Santa Barbara County Courthouse. This lantern was um, hanging in the courthouse. It was in the um, Hall of Records room for quite a few years. It's actually uh, is built much later than the rest of the lanterns that are at the courthouse. They were all built in the early 20s. This was built in around 19. 44, 45. During the rehabilitation of the Hall of Records in 2005, the lamp was determined not to be original to the space historically and was removed and stored in the basement of the courthouse. Once we got it here, we did a cleanup, assessed what it needed, and the biggest part that's been a real challenge for us is finding the glass because this glass, we're not sure. All the rest of the lights at the courthouse were made in Spain, so it's possible that this was also made in Spain but the glass is a type of glass that they don't make anymore and it's not a mouse blown glass, it's a machine made glass with a roller and I've sent the glass, it's taken me five months, I sent the glass all over the country to try and see somebody that could reproduce it without any luck. So we're finally having to pick a glass that is similar but not the same. It took several months of hard work for Tanya and her team at Holroyd Studios to fully restore the lantern to its original beauty. I think um, the size is probably the most amazing thing about it. And when you see pictures of it hanging in the um, courthouse, it was quite beautiful. And so it will be quite beautiful when it's hanging out at the airport, I think. Now that it's finished, the old courthouse lantern provides light inside the main entrance, adding a rich flavor of Santa Barbara history to the terminal. I'm sure when I go out of the airport, I'll be very proud to look up at this light and know that we did the work on it. Channing Peak's 60-foot wide mural, Fiesta, now stands proudly on the second floor of the new Santa Barbara Airport. During his lifetime, the late artist created numerous iconic art pieces displayed throughout the Santa Barbara community. Before arriving at the airport, this bright and colorful mural was once dedicated and displayed in the Gold Room of the El Paseo Restaurant in 1984. They were stored in a shed on county property, um, just wrapped in plastic and leaning against one another. Um, where a lot of wind could blow in and through, but um, under the circumstances, they're in really good shape, um, just mainly dusty. More than a decade ago, the mural was taken down and separated into five panels to be put into storage. The Santa Barbara County Arts Commission loaned the mural to the airport, enabling it to be refurbished and displayed for community members and visitors to enjoy once again. The four panels that will con constitute the major mural at the airport, will be bolted together prior to be raising, raised into place. But um, this flap of canvas right here will match up with a place on the other side of the one that it matches up with. So we will have to, in place, go and fill that seam and then in paint the seam. The airport put a team from the South Coast Fine Arts Restoration Center in charge of restoring the mural to the way Peak intended it to be viewed. I feel like I'm um, like a recycler, I guess, or a, a preservationist. Um, you want to keep things um, as in good a shape as if they were well taken care of their whole life. Once cleaned, the panels were bolted together to be displayed as one piece in the terminal. Now, thanks to Conlon and her team, Channing Peaks Fiesta is another gem for passengers to enjoy. I, I, I think it's, it's um, an honor, and um, I know Channing would be happy. He loves Santa Barbara, he loved people, so I think it's a good combination. He was the kind of person that really just loved people, so he, I'm sure he'd be really pleased 
Maybe he knows, who knows? <laughs>
uh, being a terrestrial person, um, and that's, that's the kelp. We've got these amazing giant kelp beds out there, and uh, walking along the beach, it's, you know, you're tripping over it, and it's got flies on it, and your dog rolls in it, and, and it's litter for the most part. Sometimes the kids will pick it up and play with it, and you can pop the bladders, and, and that's fun. Um, but by the time it gets to the beach, it's, it's pretty much um, on its way out. But once it's under the water, I mean, when it's under the water, it's, it's amazing. Santa Barbara's giant brown kelp, or Microcystis pyrifera, is one of the largest in the world. It grows from 100 feet deep, is fast growing, and forms a vast floating canopy on the surface of the water. It serves as a symbol for Santa Barbara's special relationship with the ocean. The ocean is such a big part of our culture here, but even more importantly, uh, once we uh, decided on this um, and started developing the idea more, it, it, it was mentioned to us by David and a couple other people um, uh, that we know that, and this is true, the kelp beds are seen best from the air. You know, when you're coming in for a landing, you're looking down, you can see those vast kelp beds, how huge they are. And, uh, you know, when you're diving, of course, you're, you're in it, but you can't see the forest for the trees because you're so close up. But you really get a sense of scale. Um, and, and you can, you know, get a sense of where the currents are uh, from overhead. Colleen worked with her husband, Alfred, and fabricator David Shelton, an experienced artist and metal worker, to complete the project. Their goal was to contribute to the overall feel of the airport, giving a Santa Barbara character to the environment. It has to complement the architecture, it has to complement the space, it has to work with the space, and if it can move people forward in their thinking, if, if it strikes them, or if it doesn't, who cares? I mean, how many times have you been to a, a large uh, a cathedral or been to a, a train station in Italy or somewhere, and you see these bizarre pieces of architecture and or ornament, and you don't stop to say, oh, gee, what does that really mean to me? It doesn't. It, it provides this place for you, and that's the important part. With a little help from the giant brown kelp railing, the Santa Barbara Airport Terminal feels like home. Located in a small courtyard by the tarmac at the Santa Barbara Airport is George Rhodes' Good Time Clock 4. The sculpture uses sound and motion as a form of expression. Motion was uh, integral. That motion was the thing. Uh, as, as still sculptures, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't convey anything. So motion was really uh, the, the reason for them. He carefully engineered a set of rails in which balls activate chimes and perform stunts as they travel downward with the force of gravity. I didn't mean these to impress in, a, in the way of uh, certain works of art, certain works of sculpture. Uh, they were simply fun. Just as he intended, this sculpture attracts and engages patrons from all over the world. To find out more about the Airline Terminal Art Program, visit flysba.com. Well, that does it for this month's episode of Inside Santa Barbara. If you have any questions or comments about the show, give us a call at City TV at 564-5311. And you can always watch the show online at citytv18.com. I'm your host, Dominique Walker. Remember to get involved inside Santa Barbara. <laughs>